Hello everyone and thank you to all the attendees for joining today's webinar. So I'm Stéphane Lacamp, I work for Obeo and I'll be your moderator today. So it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce our today's speaker, Scott Millsap. Scott Millsap is a system architect with Connect Motion, a continental and next year automotive joint venture. At Connect Motion, Mr. Millsap presently leads systems architecture development. He has developed the Capilla MBSC tool, uh, sorry, deployed the Capilla MBSC tool within the company to support uh, design activities with a primary focus on autonomous vehicle research and development. Prior to joining Connect Motion in January 2018, Mr. Millsap has over 25 years of experience in the development of electric power steering system at Next Year Automotive. And his key roles have included control systems, systems engineering, and most recently automotive functional safety based on the ISO 26262 standard. Mr. Milsap obtained a Bachelor in, of Science in Electrical Engineering from the Michigan Technological University and a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Clemson University. Thank you, Stefan. Um, I'm Scott Milsap from Connects Motion. Um, the presentation I hope to be able to present today is a um, opportunity to um, talk about experiences with model-based system engineering within our organization at Connects Motion. Uh, we are a joint venture between um, Next Year Automotive and Continental, and we were formed uh, most recently as a startup company. And I wanted to basically present today um, our experiences with model-based system engineering within the context of our organization. So uh, the outline basically here, um, I'm going to give you a, an outline of the Connects Motion background and a overview of the kind of work that we do with motion control, um, which is part of an autonomous driving system. And then I wanted to basically show or give an overview of our adaptation of model-based system engineering um, as part of this presentation. Yeah, so I want to go through um, Model-based system engineering at Connects Motion. A um, brief overview of Acadia and Capella. There was a webinar, of course, earlier this month that's been recorded where I think there um, was a, a much more deeper dive into our Acadia method and the Capella tool. But I'm going to touch on that a little bit. And then I want to go through a case study of autonomous driving. And the um, use case here is driver handover in an automated, automated driving environment. And I'll go through that. And the purpose of doing the case study review was to give you an idea of the pieces and parts and aspects of Arcadia and Capella that we're utilizing within our organization. So that's uh, the purpose of the case study was to give you a, kind of a practical or pragmatic view of how we're utilizing it. And hopefully others out there that are using um, model-based system engineering and, and system architecture tools can get a feel for how we're utilizing it in an R&D uh, research and development context. So. Next year, and Continental formed this uh, joint venture in August of 2017. And the purpose of the, of the joint venture was really to try to join the expertise of steering um, and advanced steering systems that Next Year brings to the marketplace, and then the advanced braking and automated driving um, that Continental brings to the marketplace, so that we could collaborate together in trying to bring those technologies and subsystems together onto the vehicle for an overall autonomous driving uh, applications. So in this case, um, our vision was to try to accelerate motion control through this collaboration. And our vision um, was really to, to merge the systems expertise with, uh, with expertise within our organization that we brought in, people from both organizations, uh, and apply those things. And our mission, of course, is um, to bring uh, motion control development um, and try to provide value in terms of integrating those subsystems together into some new concepts that could be, be brought back to the parent organizations. So what the first thing I want to cover is, for those that may not be fully familiar with automated driving, um, is do an overview of motion control and how it fits within the context of an automated driving system. The next motion is focused on motion control. And before, uh, we try to understand that deeper. I wanted to bring back the, the basic capabilities that are needed to do a autonomous driving in, in this case, and what are the key capabilities. They are shown here in the chart um, with 
perception, motion planning, and actuation. Those are the three fundamental pillars. Perception being the ability to see the environment through the use of sensors and merging and fusion of sensors so you can understand what's going on around the vehicle. A motion planning strategy so you can calculate and make decisions about where, where should the car be moving autonomously. And finally, the actuation capability to be able to control braking, steering, and propulsion for the purpose of doing motion control. So you can see in the uh, graphic next to the, with the graphic on the slide, you can see kind of this idea that the, the, the blue vehicle, which is the autonomous vehicle, needs to be able to see the lanes, it needs to be able to see objects such as the red vehicle in front, and it needs to plan out that there's going to be a lane change event occurring here. And these are the three major capabilities to make that a reality, to make that change. Where motion control fits in is really down in this area between motion planning and actuation, and I'm going to show that uh, in a little more detail on the next slide. So in slide seven, it's a really a kind of a high-level functional overview um, that has been prepared here inside of PowerPoint, which gives you a little bit more detail about the interfaces um, and interactions between the driver and the interfaces within the system. So the perception side showing in the yellow boxes is the sensors and data fusion and environmental analysis that's done uh, to interpret data and process that data for motion planning to see where the vehicle needs to be navigating to. Um, the motion planning is where a trajectory is determined and the vehicle's um, location in the lane, as an example, is determined. And then basically, the interface, interface to motion control is this operational intent being provided a planned trajectory for motion control to execute on. The interface to, um, the, between motion control and domain is really where we're working most of our work. Um, the box is shown functionally lateral controller and longitudinal controller are the control laws um, and control algorithms that provides the, the, basically the control requests to the domain actuation, which would be your steering mechanism, your, brake, um, your brakes, and your propulsion or powertrain. And while these interfaces of control are happening, we're also adapting and providing feedback back upstream. So feedback from the domain actuation is coming back to motion control to show how well we are achieving our, our planned motion. And feedback from motion control is also coming back to motion planning. Uh, to make sure that we're actually um, guiding along the path as intended. And I'm going to call your attention to something at the top of the diagram, and that's the interface between the driver and motion control and the domain actuation. It's uh, recognized that they're in, in an autonomous driving system that there is an interface to, to work between the driver and the, mo the autonomous driving system through the HMI or through tactile feedback, as an example, uh, like the steering wheel. You feel um, effort and feel cues through the, through the wheel itself. So there is an interface to think about in an autonomous driving system between the driver who still may be sitting behind the steering wheel and, the, and behind the brake pedals and the autonomous driving that's going on. So um, what I want to call again here is your attention is motion control's primary role, the work that Connects Motion is doing, is this ability to translate the vehicle trajectory uh, the, the plan that's been provided by motion plan to the actuator requests to the subsystems of brake steering and propulsion. So that's been um, the big focus of our, of our development effort. So now that's the main purpose. But from a secondary point of view, we wanted to understand and study um, also the role that we have with respect to interacting with the driver, that there is a, an understanding of, of an operational intent provided by the driver maybe overtake the autonomous driving and take the, steer, the vehicle back to motor, manual control, and also feedback cues that could be coming back from the domain actuation zone. And that would be, in this example um, later that you'll see in our case study, is the, the steering effort that the driver would feel if they were overtaking and taking back control from an autonomous system. On the next slide, I have a little bit um, a deeper view on the motion control interfaces and this driver interaction. And I just want to call your attention, guys, to the mo motion control inputs from the prior um, functional diagrams was planned path or trajectory and establishing where the vehicle is located in space. And then the actuator control inputs, um, in this case, the lateral control of the vehicle is in an autonomous driving scenario is an angle request to 
down to the actuators. In the longitudinal direction, it's torque requests um, to the brake and the engine to, to um, perform acceleration, deceleration. So, um, so driver interactions um, and one, one capability that's necessary in our autonomous vehicles going forward is the ability to, to override the automated control. Um, I'm sure many are very familiar with the fact that you can override a cruise control system with the brake, and that breaks you out of cruise control. In a similar way, in an autonomous system, we want to have the ability to um, break through uh, by a, um, the driver going to the steering wheel, as an example, but also support override of automated control through brake and accelerator pedals, as done traditionally with cruise control. Um, response to control feedback is typical examples of um, the hands, what you feel at the steering wheel, and what you feel in terms of the change in the dynamics of the vehicle, the, the vehicle's velocity, and the vehicle's heading, and where, they're ch where it's changing, the heading angle of the vehicle. These are things you can see and perceive um, from a feedback point of view. So what we want to explore um, with vehicle lateral control interaction between driver and the autonomous motion, that um, is what I'm going to illustrate with the, the system architecture case study that comes later in the presentation. Our focus at Connects Motion, because we're this, this joint venture between Nextier and Continental, we have all this expertise between brake and steering system experts that have been brought together to collaborate. So the focus is our ability to do integration and collaborate between these two organizations in this, in this location um, uh, here that uh, was formed as Connects Motion. And when the team was assembled, we assembled it with a lot of systems engineering um, capability, including systems um, uh, development in terms of vehicle dynamics, motion control algorithms, um, system architecture, software architects and, and software integrators, um, as I said, algorithm and controls engineers, um, the, of course, the expertise of functional safety engineering, and all the way down to electrical hardware design as well. So off to the right here, um, this is basically our team. Um, about, we're a little under 30 people right now, 30 engineers, and that's one of our project vehicles, one of our autonomous driving vehicles, uh, IBW Passat. And so that's just to give you an idea of the, the scale and the size of the of the, of the company right now. So model-based system engineering, um, what, was the, what was the emphasis for us? We have a lot of this um, system development happening and model-based system engineering is, is really um, something we desired to do with the system activities and the systems engineers that were involved here. Um, so how did we want to focus that for the organization? Uh, we decided that we wanted to emphasize the collaboration for our system development, of course, because we want to be able to collaborate within our own um, Connects Motion team, but also be able to collaborate and communicate our concepts and our development work out to our extended organizations at Next Year and Continental so they could see um, from the model-based perspective what it is that were developed. Um, we want to be able to capture the system architecture because from a model-based system engineering perspective, we wanted the system architecture to be the reference design capture for the downstream development. That's, that was one of our primary goals. Um, and we wanted to be able to provide um, capture of the system architecture at different ab design abstraction levels. Um, we, of course, need to um, collaborate and develop an, and, and uh, do requirements analysis and interact iteratively with our system design. So system requirements uh, and safety requirements need to be allocated with our design strategy. So that's something we were looking for uh, to be able to support with, with our activities and the model-based um, activities. And what would that facilitate? Examples, it would facilitate um, transitions of our, our system design from system to software architecture, system behaviors dynamics to control and algorithm models, in this case, Simulink models, and to be able to um, create system interface abstractions all the way down to the, de the detailed design. So an example here would be take those original system descriptions and work our, our way all the way down to, say, software variables and interfaces between software components. So what were the needs? Uh, as we looked around and said, well, we, we want a solution for system architecture. And 
one of the needs that we had in terms of this organization, this smaller organization of, of R&D development engineers. Well, we wanted to make sure that we had a method and a tool that was right for the right design scope of research and development. So to us, that meant that we needed to be um, adaptable to the experience levels and the size of our design team. Um, try to be lightweight in terms of infrastructure investment and the time needed to get you know, the solution up and off the ground. We wanted the ability to share and collaborate on the system designs um, because a lot of good ideas from very experienced engineers, we wanted to leave the opportunity to leave the development open for people to jump in and do simultaneous uh, development of the model and to collaborate with each other. Um, and we wanted to avoid a steep learning curve because as many I think the, in, in terms of the SysML modeling um, uh, language, our experience with SysML was not so strong um, between, the, between the team that was co uh, brought together. So we wanted to make, see if there was a way to overcome maybe some of the pitfalls of a steep learning curve around the language. Um, we also had to consider our parent organizations because they're larger organizations and they've got some well-developed methods and tools. Um, and one of the things that we do with our Connects Motion is we do develop and write out project out output reports to provide back to our parent organizations. So it was important to make sure that this model-based system engineering approach was something that could be um, easily adapted into our project reports. Um, we needed to be flexible in our architecting because in some cases a project may be very top-down where you're given a kind of an initial problem statement and you need to do um, a kind of a full needs analysis all the way down to the solution, a top-down approach. But we've also had some projects where we're asked to take existing um, components from our partners, steering brake systems, and develop them into a system concept. So much of the low-level design detail is already known. We need to be able to integrate it and move from the bottom up. So our architecting patterns and our model-based solution had to be flexible to, to account for that. We decided to look deeper into the Arcadia method and the Capella tool um, as part of the solution to try to meet those needs. So the system architectural design methodology, I'm gonna go through a few slides here on the, the method and the process. And as I said earlier, um, there are some other resources and webinars that have been hosted here um, with Capella teams that can go into greater and greater detail and a lot of resources available. But I wanted to give a, a kind of a quick overview of how we've utilized and adapted um, those. So not too much time spent on it, but just to give you a little bit of flavor. So the Arcadia method is a, an acronym, architecture analysis and design integrated approach. Um, it's a model-based approach for systems, hardware, software, architectural design, and um, developed within the fellows group uh, between 2005 and 2010. Um, and now has been brought out as part of the Eclipse platform. So it's an open source, um, it's, a, it's a method and a tool brought together uh, that's now open source. Um, but the, we liked it because the emphasis is on function, in, in my, our mind anyways, on functional analysis and allocation of functions. So, and it provides a kind of a purposeful methodology that separates the, the needs analysis portion of your, of your work and the design analysis, design solution aspect of your work. So it's structured into these five key um, analysis domains and phases, operational analysis, system analysis, levels of architecture development, um, where you're now in the solution domain, logical, physical, and, and a product breakdown structure. Um, the key thing, if you've looked at the resources and, and, and for those very familiar with Capella, is the language, um, and the method are integrated into the tool. And that we thought was a really nice um, an enhancement or a capability for us in terms of the learning curve. Because it's got, it's got the tool unites those um, principles. And when you open up the tool, um, you realize right away that you're not just presented with a blank sheet of paper, so to speak. You have a place to go and start, and, and you start working with the tool. And that was very, very um, uh, interesting to us. So. The workflow. As you can see, the tool, um, a screen capture of the tool shown off on the right here, and it shows you a workflow that's actually supported inside the tool. And I found that very interesting when working with our team members to work through the workflow to show the phases uh, and what we're focusing on when we're in those workflows. So the tool itself supports navigating and understanding some of the 
principles of Arcadia method directly from inside the tool, taking away some of the guesswork and allowing you to kind of understand the perspective. Um, the workflow is these, as I said before, these different phases um, where you're focusing on different things. And the operational analysis is where it's very high level, where you're thinking about the users of the system. Before you've even started trying to design a system, you're thinking about the needs of the, uh, of the users and what they need to accomplish. When you transition to the system analysis phase, now you're thinking about what does the system have to accomplish for, for those users. So these first two couple phases were um, very high level in our abstraction perhaps, but we're thinking about it from trying to elicit requirements and understanding what the solution sets need to be. So the trade studies can begin in these first analysis levels. When you reach the logical architecture, um, we're now deeping, jumping kind of inside of the system. We're working on the system and how we can fulfill those um, requirements that we've begun to understand from the phases above. And this is our real first opportunity to start establishing system functions allocated to, to strategies of modularity, components and modules, for an example. And then the Arcadia method allows us to go even a level deeper where we start showing how we're going to construct the system in a physical architecture capture. So now we can start talking about allocations to hardware and software components in more detailed interface def definitions. So um, thank you, Thelos. You were able to allow me to show this nice diagram that I really liked in terms of a summary of the Arcadia method and how the tool supporting these different analysis phases, they're, they're shown on the left-hand side, separated between the needs phase and the solution phase, between the operational analysis, the SA meaning system analysis, LA meaning logical architecture, and PA physical architecture development work. So the nice thing about the tools, it's supporting this methodology of developing your capabilities, um, the ability to uh, translate those and develop those into functions to support those capabilities, and then finally allocate those functions to structure. So you, at a given analysis phase, you're, you're working from an understanding of what capabilities need to be supported, developing those into functional uh, solutions, and then allocating them to, to structure. And they notice that that happens at every phase. You're kind of at that main um, focus is capabilities, functions, and structure. And if you move down another level where you're just living, you're moving down to another focus of refinement um, and, and focus uh, in terms of, uh, of the refinement and the details that need to be shown. But there's also a connection between um, the vertical level. So if you're working, for example, on a system function, um, when you move down a level into logical analysis phase or logical or an architecture level, you're now translating those into logical functions and showing more, more detail. So this is a great view, I think, for those that would be new to Capella to see kind of the whole big picture of the Arcadia method. So one last comment really about the tool side of things. The, um, the, de the desire for us to do collaboration between our team members, um, we looked around when we first got the base package of Capella um, and then realized that we could you know, probably implement some, some SVN servers and allow for baselining of models to be done and then share those back and forth. But we really wanted to collaborate more kind of real time or live. And the nice thing was that Obeo had developed a kind of a fine grained collaborative feature called Team for Capella. So this is a, a commercial, commercially available um, extension to Capella that we've utilized quite a bit. Um, what it does is it basically allows us to set up a shared repository for the model. And then team members can collaborate on the model together the slide here is basically showing an example where user A has adapted and included in a new function in green onto, a, onto an architecture component. And you can see on the right-hand side that user B is now no, kind of notified of the fact that there's been a lock made, that there's been a change made by another user. And so that, that particular element is now locked from change. So that's a way to be able to collaborate and see the changes without um, team members colliding into each other while we're in the process of working on a model. And so we've made some uh, strong usage of the Team for Capella product as an extension so that our team members could, could kind of work simultaneously together, both at the same level of analysis and then also to collaborate through the repository on different levels of the model. 
Um, so that's kind of the fundamentals of, of who Connects Motion is. We're, we're working on autonomous driving technology, and we've been utilizing the Capella tool as kind of a, a foundation for model-based system engineering, or at least a portion of it. And what I want to do now is, is talk about a case study to give you kind of a flavor for the kinds of um, portions of Capella that we've found to be useful to us up to this point. And the case study is the cooperative steering intervention. So I talked about earlier that we saw this um, interface between the driver and the system that could be occurring um, while you're in the autonomous driving mode of a vehicle. And we wanted to be able to basically study and to see if there was additional functional capability that we could extend into the autonomous driving experience and study that. So we called it cooperative steering intervention. So here is an illustration of a, a vehicle, one of our project vehicles, where um, it's in an autonomous driving mode at, at the moment. And you can see um, that the driver's hands are off. But actually what's happening here is he's making the maneuver or he's making the motion to go to grab the steering wheel because he's decided that he, he wants to intervene with the system or uh, interact with the system. Um, so the interaction here is the driver initiating this intervention. And we wanted to understand, is there anything we could do in terms of a, a problem description or problem solution? Is there anything we could do to improve the steering effort feedback that could happen during this intervention? So there are automated driving systems out on the, out in, out in, um, the roads today. There's some good examples of like General Motors has their, their Super Cruise um, autonomous system or semi-autonomous system that's uh, available today. And we have found, and also Tesla, Tesla has a, um, a system, um, the autopilot system. And one of the things we did in our benchmarking was we realized that right now these implementations generally are the driver who decides, decides to overtake the system would go to the steering wheel and basically ex exceed a torque threshold of steering torque, and then they would exit the autonomous driving experience or system. And that interaction wasn't necessarily as comfortable as we thought it could be. Uh, in terms of the torque feedback. So knowing that maybe there's a potential gap in where the product could go, where we could take this solution in the future, we decided to kind of try to come up with a, a cooperative intervention strategy. And this is a strategy where the driver can engage with the steering wheel and change the path of the vehicle, like take a lane change, but then allow the vehicle to re-enter aut autonomous driving once the driver takes their hands off the wheel. And while that interaction is happening, the driver to the wheel and then back off the wheel, we would be potentially developing a tailored steering effort that would then become a function of the deviation of the vehicle from the original path that they were driving on. So what could be the benefits of that? Well, for the OEM, it might be a nice um, um, solution for a smooth interaction between the driver and the motion control for future autonomous vehicles. I'm going to talk about the SAE levels here uh, on the next slide, uh, so I'll wait for a moment on that. And for the driver, there could be a, um, an improved temporary change of the path of the vehicle that's more intuitive to them because they could get a feel for where the next um, uh, charted path is from the autonomous system and to get to the next lane. So the evolution of fully autonomous driving, um, the Society of Automotive Engineers has published a, the, G, the J3016 um, document where they provided a framework for understanding driving automation. Since this is pretty new to the, to the world in terms of an autonomous driving vehicle, um, so they tried to define levels of automation to get an idea or give uh, some guidance on exactly what the expectation should be for, for the driver. So today there are systems out there that are level two already on the market but what that means is that the automated driving system is not perfected to the point where it, it can um, be self-monitoring. So it's required through the graphic I'm showing here is that the driver really needs to remain engaged in monitoring the system and needs to be able to take back the driving task at any moment. So in many cases, level two um, systems, the driver is required to keep their hands on the steering wheel while the semi-autonomous activity is happening. If you move up to a um, level three, it's now called condi conditionally automated, and now the capability of the autonomous driving system is such that it has enough sensing, it has enough technology that it can be self-monitoring. So the driver in this case 
has the opportunity to take their hands off the wheel, off the, off the brake pedal, off the accelerator. And in this case, um, there just needs to be a lead time provided for the, bringing the driver back into the loop. So if the, if the autonomous system determines that, that maybe there's poor visibility due to rain or fog or something like that, and that it's not going to be able to continue the driving, autonomous driving um, mission, with a lead time, it can provide warning to, for the driver to take back the driving task. And so that's shown here. Basically, driver gets back in the loop and takes over driving again with some time delay that's built into the requirements. Um, in the future, in a future, and this is kind of debated about how how far away this will be, but if you go up to levels of um, SA levels four or five, the autonomous driving system is so capable that the driver's not expected to have to take back the driving task, and in fact, they may even re be able to remove some of the, the interfaces. The steering wheel could go away because there's no expectation for the driver to have to do that task any, any longer at that high level of automation. So we wanted to think about this with a new paradigm. With the level three definition, it talks about bringing the driver back in the loop um, with a time delay. But we thought about it from the perspective that if it's an, kind of an imperfect system, there, there might very well be scenarios where the driver has to retake the system, not be the initiated by the autonomous driving system, but actually the, the takeover event or intervention is, is done by the driver themselves. And so this slide is basically showing quickly um, two things, kind of a strategic intervention where the driver suddenly has decided that, hey, I, I don't want to continue going straight down the road. I've decided that I want to get off at the exit. So they may temporarily take over from the steering side and redirect the vehicle off to the, off to the left, and shown in this example. On the, on the right-hand side is another example where it's more of a tactical intervention. The driver may be going into a construction zone where maybe there were some the original rumble strips on the side of the road and perhaps the autonomous driving system has repositioned, recognizes that there is a construction zone and laterally offsets the vehicle to account for that, but now the tires are running along the rumble strip. And that might be uncomfortable for that few hundred feet or so of, of um, going in that direction on the rumble strips. So the driver may desire to, to grab the wheel and slightly offset the vehicle um, so that they can go back to autonomous driving but get off those rumble strips and still be safely within you know, the, the, the roadway. So those are just a couple of examples of why, why might a driver actually retake control rather than waiting for the autonomous system to, to warn them that it's necessary to retake control. So that's basically kind of the operational analysis that we were thinking through at the top level of our analysis. So an overview of lateral control, just some really quick comments about that. Um, in the steering system now, we're kind of jumping down into the specifics of lateral vehicle control. Uh, a normal vehicle has power, traditional power steering, and so basically the, the control method within the steering system is a torque control. Um, the driver is the one, you know, obviously doing an input of steering angle, and what they feel is the, the road feedback, the effort that it takes to steer the vehicle. So you're feeling that, that um, the uh, steering loads that are coming back up through the tires up to the steering wheel. In an autonomous system, you're potentially going into an angle control because now you're basically getting a steering angle request from the planner or the motion control, the planner to the motion control. And so this angle request is coming to the steering actuation to say go left, go right, um, or maintain angle. Uh, so it's uh, two basic angle control modes, whether you're in a manual driving situation where the driver's in control or if you've handed off control to the autonomous through the, through the autonomous system, you're in an angle control. And in this case, if you're in an angle control at level three uh, automation, um, your hands are off the wheel. So you're not getting any feedback from the steering wheel any longer. Your feedback is basically visual, visual and audible cues that have been developed by, by the vehicle manufacturer uh, to show you what's going on with the autonomous system at that moment. So the diagram to the right is just basically showing that there are valid um, transitions between these two angle controls, uh, angle and torque controls, depending on um, if the autonomous system has requested to go into a mode or leave a mode, or if a driver has requested to, to enter or exit an angle control, angle and torque control mo mode of uh, operation for steering. So two things are possible there. 
So here is a case where we added something to the control. So those two basic controls of angle and torque control modes are there, but we've added an additional mode of control, which we called the cooperative torque control. This is the cooperative intervention with the driver. It's an actual mode that we wanted to be able to support when the driver would be desiring to retake control from autonomous and be in this kind of intermediate mode. And the key thing is the detection to know that the hands are on the wheel. When they go to the wheel, um, they are basically uh, asking to exit angle control and go into the torque control. And if they uh, exceed an additional torque level, they can actually have an exit all the way back to manual steering control or manual control of the vehicle. So this intermediate mode is what we did our development work on in order to try to provide an ability to transition between angle and torque control in a, in a more smooth uh, and efficient way. So that was just a high-level um, review of, of the kind of development work we were trying to do on an al essentially an algorithm to be added into, into the system to support that additional third mode of control. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of walk you through some of the Capella related activities that uh, we were trying to do and support and what we found useful while we were doing this project. So at the operational analysis phase, we found it useful to use some of these um, predefined pre diagram concepts within the Capella tool. They already have a name to them, like operational entity and actor breakdown is a diagram um, that can allow you to clearly identify who are the operational entities within the, con the, within the system. As an example, one actor would be the driver, and the vehicle is part of that. And the motion actuation is part of that solution. The motion control is part of that. Um, so you're interacting on a road system. So at a very high level, the autonomous system is shown interacting within an overall higher level um, environment with, the, with this diagram view. So that's nice. It's a nice view to, to be able to start very high level thinking. From that view, you can extend into operational capabilities. And I talked about, um, talked about the need to create this additional mode of operation. Well, that started with us. If you look in the lower right corner, the operational capabilities diagram it illustrates the, a, a capability that we want the driver to be able to adjust the lateral location while in the autonomous operation. So that's a capability that we defined within the, within the Capella tool. And then we in, illustrate through the interactions who's involved in that, the driver, the motion control, motion actuation as examples here in red, the red lines that are um, heading over to the entities. So these are nice diagram views that we found for the team that allows the team to see these things visually and confirm that the design team all has kind of a common understanding before we proceed into more detailed system analysis. This is an opportunity to have the discussions about the high-level concept. Have we, have we thought about all of the, the capabilities that would need to be supported on this particular development that we're doing? So we're still in the operational analysis phase. But we have the ability to identify operational activities. <clears throat> These um, um, kind of yellow boxes are, are operational activities that are defining what we are trying to do in terms of supporting this operational capability. So here's an example of kind of a flow diagram, a very high-level flow diagram, where um, we're showing and illustrating that the driver is monitoring the environment around them, has decided that, oh, I have a desire um, to change the path of the vehicle. So the decision is being made, the operational activity of deciding that the change will occur. And then that ripples over. You can see that by the driver intervening, they can request a steering override and steer the vehicle. And that can temporarily override the vehicle motion control, so on over on the right-hand side. So it's a really high-level operational activity diagram that shows how, who's involved in the operational activities that are involved for either a tactical or a strategic intervention decision that's been done by the driver. The driver initiated this intervention. So these are, and this we found also to be a useful capture of information to share with the team and think through these, through what all is the activities that would be involved. So now I'm gonna jump over to quickly to the system analysis phase. Um, now we're using a system, and, a system and architecture level diagram where you're charting out that we have a motion control system involved on the right-hand side, the SAB, SAB diagram, so to speak, um, is shown off to the right here, where the motion control is where we're gonna be doing our work, but we're 
focusing now on the interfaces around the system. So there's a bunch of things to interact with and interfaces between steering and braking, a powertrain, um, vehicle data, vehicle localization. Those are all shown in the kind of the light blue, light blue blocks that are around our system. So we're looking at it from the perspective of the boundary of our system. So that's what we utilize as a strong focus is diagrams that work around the boundary of the system, and that's our focus while we're doing the system analysis. So the collaboration that's supported by the, the Capella tool is us to, our ability to do requirements analysis at this phase. We can kind of see the hardware and software um, architectural needs, are, what, there's, what are the things we're going to interface with, and, and then the, as I said, the external systems, um, interfaces and data exchanging to out, systems outside motion control block. So the um, logical architecture phase is now a deeper dive in and at that level, we're now starting to look inside of the system, right? We're kind of treating the architecture now more from a white box perspective. So now inside my motion control block that you see in this LAB diagram to the right is components and functions are shown in green and components that hold those functions um, are shown in, the, in blue. So we're starting to detail some of the internal interfaces and modularity um, through that architecture diagram. So we find it useful to capture um, at that abstraction level, the logical architecture um, with these LAB diagrams. Data flows are also supported by the tool. So if we want to show um, more signal interfaces, we can utilize the LDFB diagrams so we can capture some of the functional and, and the modularity of the functions. And that's shown here. And then the tool has um, these functional chains that can be supported. So this diagram is showing how you can highlight who is involved in a specific um, transfer of information between functions, highlighted in blue or highlighted in red. And I, I find that functional chains are very helpful for helping people focus on specific, specific functionality and collections of functions that are needed to support a feature that you can show that to your team members um, at this logical level. So we also support requirements decomposition. I'm going to show that to you in a second and how we do that through the, through a, the logical function breakdown for requirements analysis. Uh, but before I get there, I wanted to note that the collaboration of this logical level, we really, in our organization, ha hand off our algorithm development to the Simulink, um, MATLAB Simulink tool chain for more detailed software component design. So this is the level at which we've decided to hand off the, the reference that's been capturing Capella off to the algorithm engineers for further software and algorithm development via Simulink. So the logical functional breakdown, um, there is a requirements viewpoint that can be extended for the tool where you can capture visually requirement objects into the, into the tool. And in our organization, we found that using the, fu the function breakdown diagram was probably the best way to show allocation of requirements to, to elements of the design. In this case, these are logical functions. So we're showing um, allocation of, um, theoretically, just in these examples, some, some um, requirements at the logical level that have been allocated to these elements. And I found that this is a, a diagram where it doesn't get too busy. We originally tried to do requirement objects to things like the data flows uh, and the logical architecture component diagrams, the LAB diagrams, but they get pretty busy when you're trying to start putting the requirement objects onto the diagram. So we've decided in order to collaborate with our team members and show this kind of visual view of the requirements impacting the design, we're utilizing the breakdown diagrams uh, of, these of these elements uh, instead in order to do that so that the, the diagrams don't get so busy that they're unreadable. So the physical architecture phase, in our case, um, allows us to do a couple things. We're utilizing the architecture uh, block diagram, the, the physical architecture. And actually, this case on the right-hand side is where we show how we're deploying elements of the design, the, the electronic control boxes, the actuators. We can show them, in this case, you see the top view of a sedan where elements of the design have been allocated and where they kind of lo are located physically, at least in a general way, where things are located, and what capabilities the blue boxes represent some of the behaviors or functional behaviors that um, are being allocated to these sp specific um, physical boxes. So you can kind of look down on the design uh, for those that maybe aren't is, is familiar with all the lower level details, they can get a chance to see a top level view of what's going on 
with what's been deployed onto a particular vehicle. So we kind of use that as a kind of a system mechanization um, view within the tool at the physical level. We also do the data, do data flows uh, showing where signal flows are occurring. And we found that actually to be kind of useful in an automotive sense because it's a brand new project often and we actually have to develop communications design, network design, CAN communications design. So we've actually utilized the physical um, architecture phase or level of the architecture work to actually develop um, our, through our interfaces um, and, and interactions between functions and boxes, we've actually captured the communication message packets within our, the, the Capella tool. And then that can be exported out to um, specific CAN communications um, tools, like a vector, like a vector has a tool that can help us then do more of the detail, detailed work. But we have a, an ability to export out our information in Capella out to that uh, downstream tool. Yeah, so I, I did throw one additional slide in here um, about the project vehicle because it was hard to see in the, the prior slide. But you can see here now where we have some allocation and we're showing now the CAN networks that are involved. There's several CAN networks involved here. They're highlighted in different colors. So we're kind of showing which, which boxes are communicating over what communication networks. We have some additional content that's been put on the vehicle for monitoring, like you know having a, a user display or some, some uh, uh, user interface, uh, lighting, lighting uh, like an LED light to tell you when something is on or when something is in a certain mode of operation. So we have some additional content that's not actually part of the, the motion control algorithm that we've done, but it's actual additional hardware. But it's important because it's kind of part of our instrumentation strategy. So we actually include those on the diagrams as well. Um, so when it's time to build up a vehicle, we uh, kind of have a general strategy of where things are going to be located. So we kind of come to the, the end of the presentation. Uh, lucky, I think I was able to catch it all mostly within one hour. Um, um, but as I noted earlier, there are a lot of resources. Um, and so I provided some references here in the presentation on for those that maybe be new to Arcadia and Capella um, to, for you to do some additional research. And if you're interested in understanding a little more about the um, levels of um, autonomous driving, um, the J1316 is a nice document to, to, um, to reference to understand that the perspective of where we're going with autonomous vehicles in the future. So I guess finally I wanted to kind of wrap it up um, in terms of where we're at at Connects Motion on our model-based system engineering. Um, so what, have, what has helped us with the Arcadia method? Well, it's helped us keep our attention on separating the needs analysis and deriving the system solutions because of, the, of that workflow that's been provided, the methodology that's already been defined. So it helps us give us a roadmap for the collaboration between myself as a system architect and some of our design hardware software controls engineers that are on the, on the more detailed design at levels. Um, it's helped us integrate that tool has fast-tracked our architecture process definition. So as a new organization, you can imagine that you have many, many processes that need to be developed and defined in order for the organization, uh, the engineering act activities to happen efficiently. So the fact that this process has been really identified and built into the tool, that helped us explain and develop the process definition more quickly than if we had started from scratch. We were able to adapt it to an R&D organization's level of development work. So the kinds of diagram views that I showed you they have helped facilitate describing and understanding and discussing the systems both internally and with our parent companies for a common understanding. Um, I showed you during the presentation that we have made use of a couple of um, tool extensions that aren't part of the, the base Capella package and we found them to be very effective and helpful for us. Um, the team for Capella add-on where we can have multiple um, development people, architects, modeling within the same project at the same time and do it without making mistakes or, or colliding with each other uh, mistakenly. And the requirements view, viewpoint add-on, that's allowing us to do some originating requirements analysis uh, within Capella. And then we actually take those requirements and export them into requirements management um, so that we can then do the more detailed and more disciplined requirements management activity outside of Capella. And I will say that 
our architecture development is continuing to evolve. In more recent months, since I gave this presentation last fall, we're getting more involved in um, scenario diagrams and to allow us to diagram or develop and show more dynamic properties than the static views. Um, so we can help us, as an example I give here, is to capture the dynamic properties of the soft, of a software architecture that would then lead towards the scheduler design. So on a platform, we've got to think about what modules of code are running when and at uh, what update rate, for example. So we're now utilizing the tool to capture some views to show how some of the functionality of the components are actually being uh, scheduled uh, to, and interact with each other. So this is a continuing to evolve and we're kind of building more confidence with um, additional diagram views and even more extensions into, into the base uh, Capella capabilities. So with that, that's the end of my presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Scott. Um, I guess we, had, uh, we have a time for, for a few questions. Uh, there are quite a few questions that have been asked. Um, the first one I see is uh, regarding collaboration of models. How does Capella support multiple users working together in the model diagram uh, or, or objects? And so on what level granularity can users work together? So I think I, on slide 22, if you, I don't know if you can jump back to that quickly. I think the question sounds like it's um, um, really uh, aligned towards the team for Capella to extension that we added so that multiple users can be working together. And um, as I tried to show in there, um, it really gets down to design element levels. Um, so it could be adding an example that's shown in slide 22, user A added a new function in green, a new block into, into a architecture diagram. And so the user B is actually notified that something has happened on that side and then they can initiate a refresh of the diagram so if user B does a refresh of the diagram, they're going to basically get a ref refresh diagram where now it shows that this new um, function has been added in green on top of um, the lateral controller in this particular example. Um, so it's really a fine grain. Um, on an individual diagram, the, uh, if something is adjusted or changed within the meta model, say it could be a port, a function, um, a new um, data exchange, um, that's going to be something that can be shown and, and fine grain uh, change um, ma managed by the team for Capella tool. Right. Um, there are a few other questions. Uh, some of them are related to, to, to linking Capella with uh, Simulink and simulation. Uh, other ones are linked with uh, the linking Capella with the requirements. So I'm going to start with the Simulink one. Um, Couple of questions. Are the relations between the system model and Simulink traceable? Uh, for example, do you use interface connector here? Uh, and other question. Um, the handoff you mentioned in the logical architecture to Simulink, once the handoff has happened, how do you keep the work being done in Simulink and Capella in sync? So in, in our R&D um, context, we didn't focus so much on making sure that there was strong linkage what we have done thus far is, for example, if a software um, algorithm was identified and, and, and captured within Capella, we basically do um, peer reviews where the uh, architect and perhaps the developer of, of that algorithm that's going to be done in Simulink are all in the room together agreeing on what's been captured in Capella. We then do exports from Capella into to spreadsheets, typically, where we've, we've captured a common understanding of inputs and outputs, um, the logical functions that were established for the function. So the detailed design, we try to make sure it falls within these higher level blocks of logic um, that's been described in Capella. So we don't try to go backwards though. We then allow for the Simulink to take it forward from there. If something has to change, then we would come back and make a, a change um, through interacting. We're a small team, so we're, we have the opportunity to mostly do some of this stuff verbally or, you know, exchange of, of documents back and forth. Um, so we have not tried to automate um, some kind of change impact backwards towards Capella. It's really more of a establishing and negotiating, collaborating in Capella, and then exporting that, that baseline of information out to, um, to the developer that will take it on uh, in the next phase through the Simulink tools. 
Okay, thanks, Scott. Uh, uh, jumping to some requirements question. Um, in your use case, is there still a need for a dedicated requirement management tool besides the system models? Or was the amount of requirements still manageable within Capella? So our focus has really been to, so I, the way I look at systems requirements is uh, often it's iterative, right? So a lot of times you're working at an abstraction level, maybe doing system analysis level, and you're working on an architecture, and it's actually creating an understanding of some new requirements. And so we've primarily been using um, Capella to capture those requirement ideas. I'll call it requirements analysis. So we may start thinking about, oh, we need a requirement for this because I'm thinking about adding this, this particular algorithm capability or this particular function. And so we'll do a capture of the requirement very quickly in Capella and collect that up and then do a requirements peer review on that information. Then we export those requirements through a spreadsheet capability into to Excel. And then we, uh, that's our first opportunity to bring it into the requirements management tool. So yes, we do requirements management, but we haven't really tried to do a push of requirements into Capella. That is supported by the requirements viewpoint. For example, if you were using doors, you would have the ability to push um, requirements from doors over to Capella and then allocate those requirements onto the, onto the captures of the model inside Capella. But we haven't actually utilized that because we actually try to use it in reverse. We try to use the tool as a place to think through and brainstorm and think about the requirements, um, get them captured with requirement objects, and then kind of use a manual process to bring those requirements over into, into, into the requirements management tool. Once they're in the requirements management tool and they've been accepted and baselined, they can then follow through the rest of the V, um, the system engineering V, so the testing and verification and so forth, and that the traceability, that'll all be done inside of the requirements management tool. Another question on requirements about the requirements. Using the functional breakdown to allocate requirements prevents uh, prevent you to allocate requirements on interfaces, on components. Uh, was it an issue for you? I'm sorry, Savan, what was the? Yes, so you are using the functional breakdown diagram to, to, to yeah, yeah. allocate requirements. Uh, so this means that you, can only, you are showing only uh, requirements allocation to functions, so not to interfaces, not to components. So the question oh, is, no. is it an so, issue for yeah. you? Yeah, jump. If you want to jump to slide 34, I just use that as an example. Yeah. Um, so this was an example at the logical architecture level. We had requirements around algorithm development. So the requirement objects shown in purple are an example of um, algorithm requirements, or essentially. Um, what will eventually become software requirements. They're being allocated to logical functions that could then become um, software components or software functions, I should say. But that's not a limitation. You can allocate a requirement to whatever element. It could be a component. Um, it could be a function. It could be an interface. You have the ability to allocate um, onto those specific elements. So I use this. This Our primary use is the, is the breakdown diagram. So in this case, it's a a logical functional breakdown. But if you wanted to allocate requirements to other other aspects of the design, you can do those in those other diagram views. So a logical architecture or a system architecture view where you were detailing out perhaps some interfaces, you can you can then capture different types of requirements allocated there. Okay, um, different type of question. Uh, you mentioned bottom-up modeling due to in integration of existing components like, like break ECUs. Uh, what experiences uh, do you want to share with us about bottom-up modeling, I guess? Well, an example here would be um, in the cooperative inter in intervention, driver intervention, we had to integrate an existing steering system from next year. So the bottom-up aspect of that was that we had predefined interfaces and we had predefined software that existed on the, on the electric power steering system. So that would be an example where we had to work from the bottom up to make sure that we could adapt to the existing interfaces. If there was an, an, a case where maybe we couldn't make a software change within the steering system software, we would have to find a solution, right, to, to try to work around that or adapt our higher level solution to how the, the, the interfaces currently exist. So that's an example where we found that to be the situation often from both the braking and the steering systems. If uh, it's a pre-existing brake or steering system from our partner company, 
we have to do an analysis uh, in terms of that hardware as it builds up from the bottom up to the to the complete system composition. Um, another interesting question, and maybe it will be the, the last one. Um, does the other teams, like like software architects, uh, algorithm teams, uh, do they use the same MBAC methods for their needs? Uh, and if not, uh, how do you implement the transition to other tools? So, um, as I discussed earlier, we, we would say perhaps capture an abstraction of a software algorithm, and we would show in Capella a modularity strategy. Maybe we say, oh, this algorithm needs to be split up into, say, let's we'll say, five software components. We would we would document their design net in a Capella, and then through a design review, we would take exports, um, visual exports of the diagrams, data like interfaces into Excel spreadsheets, and we would use that as the originating information after peer review and after it's been accepted out of the review and cha any changes that were necessary have been completed. Then the Simulink engineer, algorithm engineer, would use that as their basis to start their Simulink development work. Um, so there's already an understanding between the system or software architect and the algorithm engineer on what's the design approach. And then they take it over within the Simulink domain. Um, maybe the question was, you know, if it was um, a full tool chain, we might um, take this, actually utilize the tool to take us down into detailed software design within the tool, but we've chosen not to. Um, the Many of the engineers within our organization are very familiar with um, with rapid prototyping and utilizing um, the Simulink models to autocode, et cetera. So those are already expertises that we had. So we had to find a way to create a, uh, an effective interface between the Capella captures and the tool chains that they are already very familiar with at the, at the more detailed level of development. Okay, I think we are out of time for more questions. Um, so. Thank you, Scott, for a great talk, and, and thank you to the audience for the questions and for your time, and goodbye.